Hi everyone, Peter here from Flow High Performance and in this video we will cover what exactly body composition is and how it can be assessed. Before getting into the details of this nutrition series, we first need to understand what body composition is in the first place. Quite simply as the name implies, body composition is basically what the body is composed of. In other words, what our body is made of. There are many different tissues that make up the human body, but we are only really concerned with a few of these in terms of physique development and athletic performance. Let's now cover what tissues make up body composition. The first tissue that contributes to body composition is skeletal muscle. This refers to muscle mass which is involved in moving the skeleton. In other words, muscles of the body that contribute to movement during exercise. There are also two other forms of muscle in the human body, which are cardiac and smooth muscle, but these are found within the heart and other organs and aren't really relevant to this video. Skeletal muscle is a primary concern for those seeking to improve body composition for the goal of physique development, athletic performance and overall health. Skeletal muscle can significantly increase in size through appropriate training and nutrition interventions, which can make the physique look more muscular and also provide more contractile tissue for force production. Therefore, skeletal muscle is one of the most important variables relating to body composition. The other important variable regarding body composition is subcutaneous fat. This refers to fat that is stored underneath the skin and above the skeletal muscle. Subcutaneous fat is found all around the body and preferentially stored in different locations based on sex and individual variation. Generally speaking, subcutaneous fat is found less in the extremities of the limbs, like the fingers and toes, and more towards the midsection around the waist and hips. In terms of body composition, subcutaneous fat basically covers skeletal muscle, making each muscle less defined. It also contributes to overall body mass without any contractile function, making it usually undesirable for most athletes. Along with skeletal muscle, subcutaneous fat is one of the most important variables relating to body composition. We also have another type of fat called visceral fat. This is not fat located underneath the skin, but rather it is stored in the abdominal cavity around the organs. While this type of fat doesn't necessarily impact the look of a physique or athletic performance, it has significant implications for health. While medical advice goes beyond my scope of practice, it is quite clear that visceral fat is associated with negative health outcomes. So high levels of visceral fat are a general risk factor for many chronic diseases. Another tissue contributing to body composition is bone. Bone is obviously what makes up the human skeleton and contributes a decent amount to our overall mass. Changes in bone mass won't really have any impact on physique development or athletic performance, but they still have some indirect impact on the physique and overall function. The structure of the skeleton can vary fairly significantly from person to person. This doesn't mean that each person has different bones, it just means that the length, girth, density, joint size and frame size can all be different. This has implications for physique development because different skeletal structures may present different overall looks. For example, if a trainee has a big rib cage and broad shoulders, they can probably pack on more muscle to that frame compared with another trainee who has narrow shoulders. If a trainee has a large pelvis and hip joints, they probably have more potential to grow bigger glutes and thighs. Or if a trainee has a large ankle joint, they probably have more room to grow bigger calves. The other implication bone has is for health and function. A higher bone density seems to improve overall function, especially in the elderly. A low bone density generally limits overall movement competency and increases the risk of fractures, which can be fatal in the elderly. And the last tissue contributing to body composition is organs. This refers to the tissues responsible for essential bodily functions like digestion, hormone regulation and breathing. This is almost completely irrelevant to body composition for this video, so we won't go into any details. However, we should just understand that these are tissues in the body that technically contribute to our overall body composition. So while body composition involves many different tissues, we will only be talking about skeletal muscle and subcutaneous fat for the rest of this video series. This is because they are the most relevant for the purpose of physique development and athletic performance. So how can we actually assess how much muscle and fat mass we have and detect changes in these tissues? There are many ways to assess body composition, but no single method is 100% accurate and reliable. Rather, a combination of methods can be used to make informed decisions. However, it is also important to discuss why we would want to assess body composition in the first place. We probably don't need much data to realize what our goals are at any given point in time. If someone wants to gain muscle mass, they probably don't need data to tell them that. 
They just know that from how they appear and what their current goals are. Similarly, if someone wants to lose body fat, they will already know that from assessing their own physique. Regardless, let's explore what methods can be used to assess body composition and how they can be applied. The first and easiest method is visual appearance. This refers to simply looking at yourself in the mirror, in photos or in videos. While this is the most subjective and least accurate method, it is probably also the most helpful. This is because trainees can look at themselves and pretty much know right away what they want to achieve with training and nutrition. In general, most trainees are going to want an increase in muscle mass and a decrease in body fat. We don't always need an objective number to tell us this. The next method of assessing body composition is body weight. This is technically not a measure of body composition, but it can be a useful metric to use in conjunction with other methods. We can assess our visual appearance at different body weights. This can allow us to compare our current physique relative to our previous physique at the same body weight over time. Another method of assessing body composition is lifting performance. While this is not a direct measure of body composition, it can help us gauge muscle mass. Because muscle is a strong contributor to strength, we can look at trends in performance to assess how much muscle we have. If we are lifting with the same strict technique, and performance in the 6 to 20 rep range is improving over time, then this is a good general gauge that we are growing muscle. Performance can also be compared to previous lifting performance at the same body weight for long term assessment. The next method of assessing body composition is bioelectrical impedance. This is a method where electrical currents flow through the body and based on the resistance of the currents, body composition is estimated. Depending on the manufacturer of the technology, bioelectrical impedance can be more or less accurate. However, most machines are probably not accurate enough to reliably detect minute changes in muscle and fat that would occur during a resistance training program. Furthermore, hydration status and glycogen stores will acutely impact how bioelectrical impedance estimates body composition. The next method of estimating body composition is DEXA. DEXA scans are x-rays that measure body fat, lean mass and bone mass of the entire body. DEXA scans are one of the most accurate estimates of body composition and are often labelled as the gold standard. While these machines are usually reserved for research, there are clinics which provide DEXA scans to the general public. Once again, DEXA scans will be influenced by hydration and glycogen stores too. And the last common form of estimating body composition is skin folds. This is when calipers are used to measure the thickness of the skin and subcutaneous fat. This is used in conjunction with body weight and height to give an estimate of how much body fat a person is carrying. The equations used are often generalizable to the greater population, but may not be very accurate for you as an individual. However, skin folds literally measure skin thickness, which is probably the most direct measure of body composition we would want to see. If we have lower skin fold thickness, we are directly able to see more muscles and will give us an appearance of being leaner. Therefore, skin folds may best be used to directly measure skin thickness rather than using an equation to estimate body fat percentage and muscle mass. Thanks for watching and hopefully you got something out of this video. Remember to subscribe if you haven't already.